So this challenge is actually a little different to some of the other integrity challenges because this is actually based on a real bug reported by a researcher called Holm. So this is a recreation of that bug. So let's see if we can figure out exactly how he found it. So looking at the application, it's just some sort of feedback form where we can just give any kind of values in here. We have to solve the capture and submit and we get this random uh, number back. Each time we submit, it gives us this thing back. Uh, there's also this handy link that we can use which will generate the content through the URL. So the first thing that I like to do is just kind of go through the source code and see if I can see anything particularly interesting. I don't want to go through each line of code one by one because there's quite a lot here that is not really relevant to anything. So we'll just pick out some interesting parts. So things that we can learn from the source code is that they're using var here, which is kind of an old way of doing things uh, and can maybe potentially be abused through the window object. We've got this kind of pattern here where it's checking for uh, if a value exists and if it doesn't exist, then we want to assign it a value and potentially we could do something with like dom clobbering here and also if we scroll down a bit there is this big juicy looking eval here uh, which is probably something related to the challenge I would imagine. Really the only other interesting thing here is that we can also add an auto submit URL parameter and it will just automatically attempt to submit so we don't have to have any kind of user interaction to to perform our XSS. So of all those things mentioned there's one big one that kind of looks super interesting which is this eval and actually I looked through the entire source code and this is the only place that we could potentially execute JavaScript assuming this would be a DOM XSS. So there are no other sync inside of this entire JavaScript. So we are probably going to have to do something with this eval. So I kind of like to work backwards from here. And so we can look at kind of the values that make up this entire eval. So the question variable is very easy, right? It's just literally created here and it's just a randomly generated question, which we can see down here. And we don't really have much control over this. Well, we don't really have any control over this. This is all just out of the box JavaScript. There's nothing interesting I can see that we would possibly be able to do with this question variable. So then my eyes turn to this result.questionanswer.value. But we can see that that gets set here, right? So it will check if your answer, which is whatever we put inside of here, passes this regex check, which is basically making sure that the only thing that you pass in here is numbers and nothing else. And then once it's checked that you've only put numbers in there via this regex, it's going to make sure that result.questionanswer.value is, well, the answer that you put in here. And so again, that's not really useful for us because what can we really do with that? We can only put numbers in here and there's no amount of numbers that we can put into a JavaScript context that's going to result in XSS. So perhaps the answer doesn't necessarily lie within the JavaScript since I can't see any way that we'd be able to get our content in there. So if we look into exactly what's written on the page, we can see that they mention that they primarily focus on your ability to use cool Unicode and not so much on the content of your submissions. Well, that's a pretty weird thing to mention. So if we look at the tips that Integrity have provided, we can see they're also giving us a couple of weird characters here. And so, you know, also here's the Unicode representation of that. So maybe we want to look at some kind of weird encoding. So let's just test some stuff out, right? They talk about the ability to use some weird Unicode encoding. So let's just take one of their characters that they've given us and let's just shove it in and see what happens. And the output is not really anything I expected. So we put in this character here, this weird A, but we're getting out this weird box character and then CE. So we already know that Unicode is probably going to be playing a part somehow in this. So let's look up the exact Unicode representation of what we put in, right? So we can see that this is the Unicode for it, 01CE. So we can already kind of see a pattern. We're seeing that CE here, but we are getting this weird character output into the, uh, into the page. And this is basically the web browser equivalent equivalent of Pokemon's missing note. It just knows that you've given it some kind of value, but just has no idea how to actually display it. So you just get this default character here. So we don't know exactly what this character is. So we can take this character and see what exactly is the underlying Unicode representation of this. So we can see the name is control and it has an ID of 0001. And we can also see again, this was 01CE. So we can already kind of see a pattern emerging. But let's get some more info. Let's take the weird H that they gave us too. And let's see what happens when we put that in instead, right? So we're getting this exclamation mark 0B. 
So we'll do the same as what we just did a second ago. We'll take that weird H and we'll also take our exclamation mark and we will look up exactly what the Unicode behind it is. So if we look here, the weird H, we saw the zero B being output into the page right here, but we're also seeing that it began with 21. And if we look at the exclamation mark, now we're seeing 0021. So this matches the exact same behavior that we just saw for the A with the little accent. So again, if we look at a table of different encodings, we can see that 21 is being used to represent this exclamation mark. And we were able to output that into the screen. So let's say we want to try and control this. And potentially, we could use this weird ability to generate these odd characters in the page, to generate a character that should never have been embedded into the page. So let's just make sure that we understand how to control it, right? So we understand that when we had 21 at the beginning of our Unicode character, we were able to output this exclamation mark. So let's try and do the same thing, but with a hash, right? So we'll make that 23. So let's change this character and look for a Unicode character, which begins with 23. And we'll see if this outputs exactly what we were hoping. So if we put this in our page. Yeah, we can see we're now getting hash 0B, which is exactly what we expect. We get the 0B from here and the 23 is becoming this hash. So now we have a pretty interesting way of getting characters into the page directly. Well, what characters do we want to get into the page? So if we check the exact context here, we can see that our input ends up right here inside of an HTML attribute. So really the first thing that we want to do is break out of this HTML element by, well, firstly, we want to generate ourselves double quote, right? And then we can potentially write our own HTML attributes. So we'll do exactly what we did before. We know we want the ID of 22. So let's change this from 23 to 22 and we get this weird character here and now let's just see what happens if we just paste this in here. Well, although we get nothing in here, if we check inside of the HTML, we have now been able to inject our own HTML attribute. Now, the thing is, this is adding some extra stuff that we never added in there. Reason being because the browser is trying to do some clever stuff because technically what we gave it is not even valid HTML, right? Because it's, it's incorrect. We've mismatched the amount of quotes that we should have here. So if you want to see the raw response here, you could just check the network tab and see exactly how it came through to your web browser. And then if you want to see how the web browser handled it, you could check that inside of the elements. So as a side note, although we understand how to control the behavior that's really all we need to to control this but i did ask when i made my report to the the guy who originally found the bug and i asked exactly what was going on in the back end i mentioned that i still don't understand how this works exactly i just know how to abuse it and uh he said actually to this day he still also doesn't know what was going on on the server side but that somebody who also solved the challenge uh came up with kind of a guess on what might be going on that potentially somehow the unicode was being converted into this percent which then gets, you know, output into the page via URL encoding. But all that is beside the point anyway, because we understand how it works and we understand how we can abuse it. So let's continue from where we were. We're able to inject our own HTML attributes. So what interesting things could we inject? Well, potentially we can give our own uh, listener, our own event listener. So let's say that we want on mouse over to equal alert one, right? And so now we're breaking out of the uh, double quotes here and we're running our own JavaScript. Um, and if we mouse over, we can see that this attempted to run, but it got blocked by CSP. So in short, CSP is essentially a set of rules that governs what can end up in your page, right? So if you only want images from a specific source or you only want JavaScript to run that is from a very specific source, then you can set that up, right? So in this case, this CSP has been set up to only allow this specific script to run the JavaScript. So that means even though I'm able to inject my own JavaScript here, the browser is refusing to run it because of what CSP is set up on this page. So really the workaround we're looking for here is to try and trick this script into running what we want because this is a trusted source that's allowed through via CSP. If we can get this script to run whatever we tell it to, then the browser is gonna allow that through because this browser is already allowing this script to run. So let's recap, right? The only place that we can even execute JavaScript in this entire code is inside of this eval, right? So we already know that somehow we are gonna have to end up in this eval if we want to run scripts from within this source. 
So I already know that question is out of the question. So again, our attention turns to result.questionAnswer.value. But the problem is when this gets defined, we already have to pass this test here, which will basically check that the only thing that we've managed to pass in into answer is numbers. So that's a little bit difficult for us. So since we can't really play with the point when it gets defined, maybe there's something else we can do. Maybe we can define it ourselves. So that brings us back to something I mentioned earlier, which is called DOM clobbering. So with DOM clobbering, we may be able to define something that normally wouldn't be defined. So for example, we're checking here, is result defined and result is not defined. But potentially with DOM clobbering, we could inject something into the HTML that has a weird kind of relationship with the JavaScript that when JavaScript checks for window.result, it does exist. So the way that we can abuse DOM clobbering is that we need to have elements where either the name or the ID field is set to the value that they're looking for. Um, so for example, we'll just edit this directly in the HTML for now, and then we'll see if we can kind of use the vulnerabilities that we have to do this. So let's say we set an input field to result, right? And now we have an input field with the ID of result. And now when we check if result exists, well, JavaScript has this shorthand way of searching the DOM and checking, okay, well, are there any elements on the page with an ID or a name attribute set to result? And then if there are, then that will be the value of result. So let's go back to our script and look at exactly what they wanted, right? So we're looking for result.questionanswer.value. So right now we only have result. And if we try to get question answer, well, that doesn't exist. So how can we make result.questionanswer resolve to something that we have? So the way we can do that is that another trick with DOM clobbering is that if we have two elements with the same ID, then we set result here. And then when we call result, this is actually going to be a collection of uh, DOM elements here. So now we can use the name attribute to set this question answer variable, right? So in the exact same way that it was searching the DOM for anything with a name or ID set to a specific value, now that we're dealing with this, um, this collection of elements, now if we go result dot and then we give it another value, let's say question answer, well, now we get back this second element here because just like with the first time when we gave it result, it searched the DOM, tried to find anything with an ID or a name set to that specific value. Now we're giving it this collection. It's gonna search both of these to see, okay, well, is there anything within these where I can get to question answer? And since this has the name of question answer, now we get back this second value here. And so now we are able to clobber the reference to result.questionAnswer. Now all we need is .value, right? That was the end thing that it was going to. Well, we have an input field here. So input fields can have a value attribute given to them. So let's fill this with a JavaScript payload and let's comment out anything that runs after it. And let's just see if we can run the exact same thing that they're running here. And if that would actually result in JavaScript execution, if we were able to get that into the page and we can see that it does in fact run. So now what we need to do is use our little technique to embed our own characters, to embed the characters we need to set these elements up into the page. So we already know one of the characters we need. This will give us our double quotes. And if we check what the other characters are that we need, we're gonna need this and we're going to also need this. So that is a 3C and a 3E. So now using the exact same method we did before, let's just literally find a Unicode character that begins with 3C and 3E. So here's a 3C and here is our 3E. Cool, so now we're set up to actually build our payload. We have all the characters that we need to actually exploit this. Let's just wipe all of the manual stuff I did and see if we can use what we have given to us to actually embed that in the page. Let's look again at our context and build what we want. So we are currently injected here. So we wanna start by closing that off with our double quotes. And then we wanna close off this tag using this 3E so that we can exit the input field that we're already in and start creating our own stuff. So let's just run that and see what happens. So yeah, we can see that we are able to successfully close this input field and the rest of the data is now just hanging in HTML. So let's see if we can now generate our own elements. So again, let's take our character here and that will be our opening bracket and we'll take our character here, that will be our closing bracket and we want an input field, right? And let's say we want ID equal to uh, 
well, let's just try result, right? So supposedly this should create us an input field. And if we inject that directly in the page, we will see that we didn't quite get what we wanted. Again, let's go to network just so we can see exactly how it came through to the browser. And let's go to 21 input. So this is the problem, right? Because the character that we added, which is for um, for opening our bracket, ends in 2-1, as you can see here, that gets embedded directly into the page right after our character. And that means that we can't just do input like this. We have to do this character and then two Two characters here so in this case it's 21 and that's not a valid HTML element so there's really no easy way that we can get around this we're kind of trapped here because these two characters will always always precede this character here and so we need to figure out okay well these two characters can change well, maybe we could find ourselves some kind of HTML element that happily starts with two valid characters. So let's think about what exactly are valid characters. So because this is Unicode, we know this is hexadecimal format, right? So we get any numbers 0 to 9, which is what we have here. But then we also get A to F, right? Any character between A to F because it's base 16. So what I did is I took every HTML element that I could find and I ran some regex on them. So I'm saying the string has to begin with characters between A and F and I want there to be at least two of them because we know there will always be two characters output, right? And then we'll say you can end with anything. And if we put this multi-line flag on, now we're getting 15 matches here. So if we look this is our, oh, it's a duplicate, but this is our final list of the um, HTML elements that we could potentially use here. So I already know that we can set ID or value to any HTML element we want with no problems because that's kind of universal. But the problem is that we won't necessarily be able to set a value attribute on any HTML element because not all of them require to having a value set to them. So we were using input previously because you know you can grab the, the value of that input field. So we need to find an element here which has that uh, ability to have a value attribute. So I quickly found that data matches that perfectly. We can set a dot value attribute on that because data elements normally do have a value attribute set. And so we can use that in our final payload. So here's the character we were currently dealing with. And that's why we got our 21. So we want this exact same thing. We want the 3C because that's what represents our um, opening triangle bracket. But instead we wanted to end in the characters D and A so that we can complete those characters and say D, A, T, A and have a valid data tag. So let's literally just get that character here. And great, we have a character that should be perfect for us. So let's replace that. So let's make some changes here. So this will output our bracket with DA added on. So we need to change this from the word input to TA to finish our data tag. So let's see if we can do that. If we enter that and we check what got output here, great. We now have our very own embedded data attribute, uh, data tag. So let's not forget that this is the format that we're trying to reach. So we already have our first element put in the page. So now we just need to do the exact same thing, but to put our other, other element in, but with the extra um, attributes added. So here we're going to set another one, set the ID also to result so that they get grouped together. And then we want to set the name to question answer. And then we also want to set the value to our, our JavaScript payload and also comment out anything else. So now if we check, this is getting embedded directly in the page. However, it will not run yet because one, we have an assignment text set, which uh, there's a check for it will get overwritten, but that's not important. We just remove that. And we also need to add our auto submit parameter. And now that is it. We solve the challenge. We can do origin in here and prove that it is running truly on this web page. So I think a super cool challenge. I think if you look at the uh, final solution, even if you gave this to somebody who is quite well versed in, uh, you know, dealing with exploits like this, I think this would still just look kind of mind blowing to other people. So I always love things like this where it just looks so crazy by the end. But yeah, happy when I managed to solve it and it was a really fun challenge.